Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. So today we're going to be talking about the game of life. How many of you have ever played this game before? Raise your hand. Sure, we've played this game. My family likes to play board games. Uh, as a family, one of the games we sometimes play is the game of life. By the way, stick around to the end of the service, and here's why. There's going to be a giveaway. You say, what giveaway? I'm going to be giving away this box to you, to somebody in this room. Somebody, oh, say it. I'm going to be giving away this box to somebody in this room. I know. I used to be a children's pastor. I used to, whoever pays attention the best, I'm watching. The game of life, it's something that my family has liked to play for a while, but um, the, here's the problem with the game of life. My, my son breaks the rules. <laughs> How many of you are glad you're not a pastor's kid today, would you say amen? <laughs> he does. In the game of life, if you're not familiar with the game, uh, you get a little car, and then you put your people in it, and you travel through the game of life. And one of the objectives is uh, to get to the end of life without ending in the poorhouse. How many of you, you know, that's maybe not your main objective, but it's one of them, right? <laughs> and uh, in the game, very early on, uh, you get married in the game. You get married in the game. And uh, there's no choice about it. You cross a certain block, and it says, today you got married. You're at a church. There's a steeple. You get married. I'm playing with my son. He says, I'm not getting married. <laughs> I said, you have to get married. You've got to play the game. And he says, no, I'm going to change the rules. I said, you can't change the rules. You got to get married. I said, now later on, you get married, you have children, there are these deductions, you get extra money later on in the game, have the children. <laughs> I want to be a grandparent, you know? <laughs> he says, I'm not getting married. I said, are you going to have children? He said, yes. I said, you can't have children if you don't get married. He said, yes, in real life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt 12 children <laughs> by myself. I'm going to call them Jonathan's orphans. How many of you realize my son is not politically correct yet at the age of 13? <laughs> Here's the reality about this game and any other game that you get from Milton Bradley or from Hasbro Gaming. Here, here's the reality. You can't win unless you play by the rules. Here's what I'm trying to say over the next few weeks. You can't win the game unless you play by the rules. There's certain rules that life, is, that life gives us, um, certain rules in the game of life. You say, I just don't believe in the rules. You don't have to obey the rules you just lose. Certain rules you have to obey in order to win the game of life. For example, here, here's a rule that we all agree with. If you get up on the building and you jump off the building, what is the rule that you are tempting? Gravity. See, I don't believe in it. It's fine. Jump. <laughs> and you're going to see that the rule of life is what goes up must come down. Sorry, you're not an exception. You'll fall. You'll break a leg or die. So that's the rule of life. There are a lot of them. I don't have time to get into all of them. We're only going to be talking about rules of life as in regards specifically to money as given in the book of Proverbs. Now, understand, Proverbs was written under the law of Moses, but these Proverbs jump out of that dispensation and fall into all periods of time. What I mean by that, for those theologically that might, might grasp what I'm saying is, these are not Old Testament principles. These are all Testament principles. These are truths that from the book of Proverbs that, that applied before Moses got there, after Moses got there, when Jesus came, after Jesus came. Throughout all of time, the rules of life that we're going to talk about regarding money are going to blow your mind and are appropriate for all time. What are those rules? Well, I'm only going to give six this week and next week. Three today, three next week, and then the final week is going to be this very, very cool panel that I will be moderating with individuals, and we're going to be discussing the principles and the rules of the game of life or financial uh, peace. So let's go ahead and begin with the very first rule, with this thought to begin with, and that is this. Those who follow the rules will likely win the game, all right? That's the main concept today. Those who follow the rules will likely, likely, not all the time, likely win the game, or at least progress farther than others. Now, I want to speak right now very quickly, and I want you to hear me for the younger people in the room. Now, I know we're all young. Relax. But I want to speak to those specifically that, that, that are 30 years old and below. Now, hear me, hear me. There are those today who are attempting to change these rules. 
and attempting to write new rules in regards to money and life. Here's the problem. They did not invent the game. So I'm going to say some of these rules, and you'll be like, I don't think I believe that. It's okay if you don't. You say, I think I heard somebody say it differently. It's okay if they did, because they didn't write the rules of life. And today especially, we are rewriting, or some are attempting to rewrite the rules as regards to money, finance, and biblical understanding about the way the rules work in regards to money. And I'm telling you, I would probably take it from the Word of God what these rules actually are. So here's the question uh, that I have today. Do you know the rules of financial freedom? Here's the first one. Here's the first one. Number one, work hard and get ahead. Very simple. Work hard, get ahead. You say, wait a second, I've heard that that's just not true. I know, because there's a lot of people trying to rewrite the rules. But this is a rule found in the book of Proverbs, 3,000 years old, written by the wisest, wealthiest man who ever lived, named Solomon, that spans all of time prior to Moses, in Moses, and beyond Moses. Work hard, you'll get ahead. There it is. Work hard, get ahead. I want somebody to raise their hand and tell me, where does the Bible say, quote, You've got to love your job. Where does the Bible say that? Anybody know? <laughs> Come on. It's in like Second Opinions, chapter 12. <laughs> the Bible never says you've got to enjoy or you've got to love your job. You've got to love your job. You've got to love your job. The Bible doesn't say that. Instead, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29, which you're reading, it's in your Bible. Look at it. Instead, it says, do you see a man diligent or skillful in his business? What does it say? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Here's somebody who works hard at their job. It doesn't say, go find something that doesn't feel like work, and eventually you'll just enjoy. Here's the reality of work. Work is always work. We, we, We think this because we're told by the world today that the reason you're not getting ahead is because you did not find a job that just makes you tingle every time you walk in the door. (laughs) And young people are believing this. Sometimes, listen, now I'm trying to help you. Boy, if you really want to get ahead, you find something in your life that you just love every moment of it. Well, the fact is, instead, find joy in the work you've been given. There's no perfect job. Work hard, get ahead. How do you know there's no perfect job? Because I'm a pastor. I have a lot of friends. I'll sit down with a pilot. I always thought to be a pilot would be awesome. Flying airplanes. Oh, that'd be awesome. How many of you would be scared to death if I was your pilot? (laughs) I'd be scared too, man. I'd be scared. Be a pilot. You know what I thought? I say, man, what's it like? I over coffee. I do that. What's it like to be a pilot? Yeah, it's a job. I'm like, "Don't, don't blow my fantasy, man. I've talked with doctors. Man, it would be amazing to be a doctor. What's it like to be a doctor? It's a job. You're an attorney? I'm an attorney. Yeah, I'm I'm a lawyer. What's it like to stand up there and make the case? It's a job. As a child, I wanted to be a garbage man. (laughs) How many of you, too, want to be a garbage man? You watch the guy go by, he jumps on the back of the thing, and you ride on the back of a truck. Awesome. It's a job. Look. It's always the same answer. Hear me. Because of the curse found in Genesis upon Adam, no matter what job you get, there is an element of labor to it. And that labor is laborious. It's tedious. It's hard work. Hear me. So whatever you do, there might be elements that you like about your job, but there are definitely elements you hate about your job because it's a job. So you work hard. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4 says, the soul of the sluggard desires. It's not that the lazy person doesn't want things. The soul of the sluggard desires but doesn't have things. Why? But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The person who is lazy wants but will never have. But the person who works hard will be made fat. Some of you are on a diet right now. And you're thinking, I don't want to be made fat. In the ancient days, to be overweight was a blessing. How many of you wish you lived in the ancient days? In the ancient days, days of antiquity, if you were overweight, it meant you had more food than you needed. 
And what this is saying is a diligent person will financially succeed. Say, oh, I don't know, the, the system is rigged. Rigged? You want to talk about rigged? Talk about a guy named Joseph who was thrown in a pit, who was sold as a slave. And as a slave, he worked hard with the blessing of God upon his life, and he advanced to be the second most important person in his business. Then the deck was rigged again. He was accused of something he didn't do, and he got thrown into prison. It was rigged. And then you know what happened after that? He worked hard in the prison for over a decade and got in charge of the prison. If it was ever rigged against anybody, it was rigged against Joseph, but these principles still held true for him. I would say that probably it's less rigged for us than it was for Joseph. I remember when I was 18 years old, I got a job for the grounds department at the college that I was attending. They were gracious enough to hire me and put me as a, um, a weed specialist. <laughs> for young people, titles are very important. I was a weed specialist. And uh, I remember clock out time was 5 o'clock. I'll never forget, it's clear in my memory as I possibly can. We had these little golf carts and we'd go around and we'd pull weeds. And 5 o'clock, it was about 4.30, and, and some of the guys I was working with said, it's time to go. I said, well, we're supposed to work till 5, right? They said, yeah, we got to get back to the place. I didn't know if there was like some kind of checkout procedure or whatever. We arrived back at grounds headquarters about 20 minutes till 5. We put all our stuff away, and it was about 15 minutes till 5. And then I saw what a lot of you see all the time. I saw a line of about two dozen guys standing in front of the clock, with 15 minutes to go, wait, waiting to check out. Standing there, waiting to check out. And I remember thinking as an 18-year-old, I remember thinking, man, that's, that's sad. It was three days later, I was there with them. <laughs> then I remembered something my brother had taught me the summer before when I was working as a dishwasher with with him, he, had run, he was running this kitchen, and I was working as a dishwasher, and my brother said to me, Josh, he said, you're lazy, <laughs> and there's a few things you need to learn. Number one, always show up before everyone else. Number two, stay later than everybody else stays. And number three, never say the bad words. I wanted to hear my brother say the bad words. I said, what bad words? He said, never say, it's not my job. And I remember a couple weeks went by, and I'm working in the grounds department, and I see everybody doing this, and you know what I thought to myself? I thought, man, I kind of am lazy, and I, I sure would like to get ahead, and I don't necessarily want to pull weeds for all four years of my, my, my college career. I, I wonder if I can advance. And I remember saying, I'm going to follow my brother's three rules. I'm going to show up before everybody else. I'm going to stay later than everybody else, and I'm never going to say that's not my job. And I'm not a perfect person by any means. I, I mess up all the time. I tell you about all the things I mess up in, but I got to tell you, Decision to do that changed my life. What I'm trying to say, especially to those that are young in this room, hear me now, hear me. You can make a decision that will affect the rest of your future if you just do those three things, like the Bible is saying. Show up early, stay later than everybody else, and never say, that's not my job. We live right now in a generation that is being accused of not working hard. Well, it's just my generation. Then what you can do is shine really brightly in the midst of a bunch of lazy people. You'll stand out like a shining star in the midst of others who aren't doing their job. And they'll call you brown noser. And they'll call you suck up. And eventually they'll call you wealthy. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24. And they'll say, it's not fair. That's what they'll say. Proverbs chapter 20, 12 and verse 24. It says, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slothful will be put under forced labor. I didn't write this. The person who works hard will become the boss. And the lazy person will be put down to do forced laborious stuff. Can I say this to be true, that some never get ahead because they quit too early? Look, hard work is not simply about effort. 
and energy. It's about longevity. Some, people, so, some of us sometimes say, I, I think I really work hard. You do in short spurts. We do in short spurts, don't we? Man, we work really hard. But it's not just about the energy that you give in the moment. It's about a commitment to longevity that says, I'm not going to quit. The tortoise wins every time. How many of you know that? It just keep going. Some, some of us will never experience true success in the area of finance because we're constantly jumping from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. These are the questions we ought to be asking ourselves. Do I arrive early, you see? Do I serve others? Do I look for opportunities to advance the company, not myself? Listen, listen. Do I look for opportunities to advance the company, not me? This is, this is good. Do I stay late to accomplish the goal? Am I committed to this career long term? The Bible says he becomes poor who deals with the slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The person who becomes the poor person is the one who is dealing in slack hand, lazy hands. But the hand of the diligent will become rich. Again, I, I hate to keep saying this, but I feel it necessary today. I know that this is just one opinion in the world. I know there are a lot of other opinions that don't teach this. All I'm doing is sharing God's opinion. The guy who wrote the game of life. I would, I, I would follow it, is what I'm trying to say. I remember waking up with a headache a couple years after the job that I had uh, in grounds. I, I had um, I'd gotten a new job. Somebody, I guess, had taken notice, and I got a job in the promotions department at the school. And I remember getting a, a phone. I woke up early in the morning. Um, I had to get to work, and I had this headache. I remember thinking to myself, oh, I have a headache. And it's always shocking to a young person when their body hurts. I remember thinking, man, I got a headache. What's wrong? My head hurts. Why does my head hurt? Oh, I've heard of this. It's called a headache. <laughs> and I called my supervisor, Mr. Wilkening. Mr. Wilkening is now a pastor up in Washington. And I called Mr. Wilkening. I said, hey, Mr. Wilkening, I'm not feeling well. His reply was, and? <laughs> I said, well, I'm not feeling well, so I won't be able to make it today. He said, well, what's wrong? I said, I've got this headache. He said, I, this is where he, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'll see you at 745. <laughs> I, I was like, I was shocked. I was like, what? But I'm not feeling well. So I got up. I got up, you know. Later that day, he sat me down. I, I felt better. I got to work. I had a little headache. I did my job. Later on, he sat me down. It was, I thank God for this moment. He sat me down. He said, Josh, work through the pain because people are counting on you. If you want a life where no one counts on you, then give in to the pain. Can I just say that if you can't be trusted to get the job done, very few will ever have a job for you to get done. I know a girl named Jessica sits in this room. She is rarely feeling good. She has a lot of physical ailments. Over four years ago, she went to a college that demands quite a bit academically and physically and everything else. And I watched for four years as this girl who rarely feels good, like most of us, went to class and went to work and did her job and worked through four years of school, moved back to Vegas. She has times where she just has to get away because chronic fatigue and just rest. And now she's back in Las Vegas. She just landed a job in corporate America here at GES. And I think she deserves a little recognition for that. You see, work ethic is about keeping your commitments even when you're not feeling well. Hear me, please, please. I know there are people who will not tell you this. Work, work ethic is about keeping your commitments even when you're not feeling well. And so we see number one, work hard and you'll get ahead. Number two, here's the second rule of the game of life in regards to money, wealth, and finances. Number two, spend wisely. 
How many of you already want to go back to rule number one? How many of you are like, how do you like, I like the first one, I work hard. And then when I work hard, I get what I want and I spend it, right? Uh, this one is not great for me. Honestly, this one I'm not as good at. That's why I have Fred right here beside me all the time trying to tell me what to do. I try to hide my purchases from Fred. He will not let me hide my purchases sometimes. <laughs> Spend wisely. Look at what the Bible says about this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17. It said, in verse 13, it says, who, uh, I'm sorry, verse 17. It says, who, he who loves pleasure will be poor, and he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Okay, let me ask you a question. What is the opposite of pleasure? Anybody know? Pain. Somebody said, what's the op opposite of pleasure? Pain. How many of you love pain? Nobody loves pain. How many of you, though, like pleasure? How many of you say, Pastor, I have to admit it, I'm in church, I like pleasure. How many of you are like, Josh, you like pleasure? So what is this verse saying? Some of you are like, I'm not sure, the Bible says not to do it. <laughs> so what is it saying? It says, he who loves pleasure will be poor. What it's saying is this, the person who lives constantly for pleasurable, luxurious things will eventually be a poor man. It doesn't talk about how much money they have. How many of you realize you could have a ton of money and still go toward poverty because you spend more than you have? But he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. What does this mean? The person who is focused on the luxurious items of life will eventually, eventually lose it all. Growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, but my, my dad always liked to, um, when we were going to celebrate, it was going to be about food. And uh, so we, he, he would celebrate, say, come on, kids, we're going to go to Albertsons. And we would, uh, he, would buy, he would buy ribeye steaks and baked potatoes, and he would buy, go to the deli section, and they would have the imitation crab meat salad. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That stuff is awesome, man. As a kid, I didn't even know what imitation crab meat was. I just know it was seafood, and it was awesome. It was a little bit of a luxurious item for us. And I remember one time, we would give this every time, and I remember one time there was a church in our a family in our church. My dad was a pastor, and um, there was a family in our church who invited us to a buffet, and that was back in the day where they started serving crab legs on the buffet line. And I remember thinking, oh, we're here. Oh, crab legs. Oh, like my imitation crab meat salad. Uh-uh. It's not the same thing. I remember going over and, and grabbing a plate and then a couple more plates. Have you ever done this? You started loading up the crab, crab on the thing. I had no shame, baby. I had like 700 crab legs. I brought them back. I sat down. They had at this buffet, if I remember right, these miniature lobster tails, like little miniature lobster tails where you could pull them. Out. And I remember sitting there. I didn't eat no salad. Who wants the salad, man? I didn't eat any potatoes. I didn't eat I just gorge myself on crab and lobster. I remember telling my dad as we left, I mean, once you have that, you can't go back. You know what I mean? <laughs> Invitation crab meat salad. Give me a break! <laughs> Scared you? Sorry about that. Scared somebody at <laughs> that. Sorry, Pastor. All right. I told my dad, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to have lobster and crab every day. <laughs> this is what he said to me. He said, you can as long as you can afford it. You work hard, you can afford it, have whatever you want. No, he was not a doctor, so I just want to say relax. And I was like, I can afford it. But I love that, if you can afford it. I like what Dave Ramsey says. He says, very simply, act your wage. Act your wage. Here, act your wage. Isn't it sad to see an, uh, a, a person who is not acting their age? How much sadder, according to Proverbs, is someone who doesn't act their wage. They spend more than they have. This is dangerous. It's a problem in our nation right now, but especially, I would say, not only in our government, but in our homes. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 20 says, There is a treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but foolish man squanders it. You look into a home of a big, wealthy home, and you think to yourself, oh, but there's nice stuff in there. Guess what? You're right. There's treasure and oil and wealthy, luxurious things in that home. And you step back, you're like, man, oh, but there's some nice stuff in there. There is. And sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves and say, why don't, why don't I have that? And the Bible says, the man who's given to poverty will squander it. See, I wouldn't squander it. What are you doing with the finances you have now? Are you being wise with them? 
See, understand, God is your father and he knows every detail about you. And as he watches you deal with your own finances, he knows if he can bless you with more or hold back. See, I don't know if I like this rule. I know it's a hard rule for me too. But if you learn the rule and you follow the rule, you'll see that in the end you'll be blessed. See, this is what the word of God is saying. You say, well, I just, I just, it's hard for me to control it. What about Warren Buffett? I was watching the HBO documentary of Warren Buffett. If you haven't seen that, it's, it's fascinating. It's called Becoming Warren Buffett. It's a great one. It just came out in February, great one. How many, anybody seen it? it? In it, it shows this really cool scene where uh, he, goes to, um, he goes to get breakfast. And he has in his little cup tray in his car, uh, three dollar bills and 17 cents, I believe is what it was. And sometimes it's two dollars and like 87 cents, depending on what his mood is. He pulls through the McDonald's, he says to the camera, I go here every day. When Warren Buffett says he goes there every day, it probably means he goes every day. You know Warren Buffett, right? The richest, second richest person in the world. He, and this is what he states, he never spends more than three dollars and 17 cents on breakfast ever. You say, what does that mean? It's what the Bible is saying. It's saying that there are treasures in the house of the rich because they don't squander everything they have. It's just, he's a living example and illustration of this truth. I'm not saying you have to go to McDonald's every day for breakfast. Please don't. <laughs> Talk to your doctor. <laughs> what I am saying is that we buy cars that we can't afford. We buy homes that are too large for us. We go on vacations we can't afford. We become slaves to our credit cards. We go to dinner and we can't even afford to pay for it other than by charging it. And what I'm saying is, we wonder why the biblical rules are working against us. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 and verse seven, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. A lot of times those of us, quote unquote, that are down here, we look up at those that are up there and we think, man, it's like they rule over us. And the answer is, you're right, they do. Because we get ourselves into debt, the rich, those who we indebted ourselves to, rule over you. You want to have freedom? Get out of debt. Start a plan to get out. By the way, some of you might be saying, how do I do that? There's a practical way. I never like to tell you what to do from the Bible unless I show you how to do it. There's a practical solution you can sign up. Pastor Fred leads a class called Financial Peace University. And Financial Peace University, which I took myself, it changed my life about seven or eight years ago, helps so much give biblical principles on how to get out of debt and follow the rules of financial freedom. You can do that even today. Sign up for the class. Here's a, here's a simple question that's practical. Are you budgeting? Do you tell your money what to do, or do you tell uh, your lack of money tell you what you can't do? So we see these are rules that are found by this wise man named Solomon. The first one is very wonderful. It's work hard, get ahead. The second is spend wisely. Here's the third one today, and that is, the last one I can give you today is, take care of the poor, and God will take care of you. This is a rule. It's as sure as gravity. Take care of the poor and God will take care of you. Proverbs 21 and verse 13 says, Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he will also cry himself and will not be heard. This is a, a great rule, all right? Look, even if you don't do well at the other ones, I'm telling you, you start doing good at this one and, and, it, and it works. The Bible says, the person who says, I don't want to hear the cry of the poor. I don't want to hear it at all. God says, one day you're going to cry out to him for help and he won't hear you. What? Now, some of us feel like, and this is true of us, and I'm trying to help. This is true of me too. Some of us think this verse is only speaking to wealthy people. So because I am poor, this verse does not apply to me. I'm not obligated to follow this verse because I am poor. Now, hear me. The reality is you are not poor. Likely in this room, you are not poor. See, you don't know my finances. If you live in Las Vegas, I kind of do. Did you know the average medium income in Las Vegas is $51,500? Average medium income for a household. I'm not saying that that's what you have. I'm just saying if your household brings in $51,000 or more, did you know that you are the top 0.29% of the richest people in the world? 
Not the top 2%. Not the top 1%. You're the top 0.29% richest person in the world. You say, well, I don't nearly make that much money. If you have a single income in your home and you bring in $25,000 a year, that is your entire home only brings in $25,000 a year. You are in the top 2% richest people in all the world. Those below the poverty line in Las Vegas are the top 2% people in the entire world when it comes to wealth. What I'm saying is you're not as poor as you think you are. If you are wealthy, you have a responsibility to care for the poor. The poor. Can I get an amen there? Christianity has forgotten this principle. Christianity has forgotten the principle that Christians, like Jesus, are responsible to love the poor, to care for the poor, to bring uh, justice and, and help and, and, and wealth to the poor, if possible. Proverbs, and I'm going to talk about through government legislation. I'm talking about through charitable giving yourself. Proverbs 22, verse 9 says this, He who has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. God says if your eye is evil, in another passage, and you're greedy, you won't be blessed. But if you're somebody who has a bountiful eye, a giving eye, and you give your bread to the poor, you'll be blessed for doing that. Hear me, when was the last time you gave sacrificially to someone who is less fortunate? I'm introducing some of you now to what's called the cycle of giving. God in heaven sees you give, and he blesses you for giving. It, it's, it's, it's the generosity cycle. It's the cycle of giving. What happens is this. We all know this to be true. God in heaven gives you money because he is generous. But he is generous with you so that you can be generous with others. And if you are generous with your money, God will likely be more generous with you. Doesn't that make sense? So here you are. God's giving you wealth. And what do you do? You need to give some away. The more you give away, God will be like, man, they really give to the poor. I'm going to give them more. The more you get, the more you say, oh, man, I've got to give more. The more you give, the more God gives to you, and the cycle continues. Jesus said this, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Men will give to your bosom so much that you can't even handle it. The idea is that's the giving cycle. It's a rule of life. What goes up must come down. You give away. God sees it. He blesses you. Give, 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 give. Boy, this is one principle I got to tell you. Man, it's changed my life. I always wondered where my father-in-law got his money. <laughs> I really did. I'm just being transparent. Uh, I married, when I met Heather, first thing I said, man, she is beautiful, gorgeous. Second thing I said, she's got a car. What's up? <laughs> What's up, baby? 1996 Ford Thunderbird. Relax. And, uh, man, that means she had wheels, she has freedom. Uh, the more I got to know her and her family, the more I realized, man, she got, they, they, they got not they wealthy. They're doing okay. Doing all right. Nice home, nice cars. When we first got married, my father-in-law and mother-in-law sat us down and said, you're young, we want you to enjoy your youth before you have kids and all this. We're going to send you to Europe. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Sounds good. God bless you and your bank account. We would take trips with them. Heather's mother's in heaven now, and Heather's father's not doing too well, but we'd take trips with them. I remember one trip we took to Savannah. I always wondered, I always wondered where, where, where he got his money. The fact is, he, didn't, he wasn't some inventor, you know. He didn't play a professional sport. He's just a worker. He followed these rules. Worked for a company for 40 years. I was sitting, it was Savannah, Georgia. We were there, obviously, on their dime, not mine. And uh, my wife and I had, uh, were walking down this uh, riverfront. Some of you may have been there. You know the riverfront in Savannah? Some of you may have been there. And we're walking down, and there was a, there was, I remember there was a shop I wanted to go to because they sold fudge. And uh, my wife and I were walking, and there's a homeless guy um, standing there, and he, he, at, he, you know, and I kind of looked the other way and we kept walking. And I walked inside, got a little fudge with my father's money, you know, father-in-law's money, came out, and I saw my father-in-law standing over there by the man. I saw him reach into his pocket and pull out a $20 bill and give it to the man. 
in my mind, I had all sorts of, man, my father-in-law is going to get conned here. I just spend it on liquor probably anyway. Judgmental, judgmental, selfish, selfish, selfish me. Better ways to do it. Man, he needs to get it. One there was like Jesus, and that person was not me. I was like the Pharisee. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, don't rob the poor. Proverbs 22, do not rob the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul who spoils them. You know what the Bible says? God watches out for the poor. And you take advantage of the poor through your business. You take advantage of the poor through your society. You take advantage and hurt the poor, mock the poor. God says, I'll watch that. And whoever does that to them, I will do that to them. Whoa. So this is a really cool rule to learn because once you learn it about life, you're like, so God loves the poor, and if I take care of the poor, he'll take care of me. I'm down. Learn that, learn that rule, do it. You say, well, I mean, just so you can be taken. Look, man, I want to know how the game works. I want to make sure I'm following the rules. So what are some practical ways that you can give to the poor? I mean, can you give to international evangelism, missions? The fact is, most of the wealth in the world is in places like the United States. But if we've got missions to Africa and to South America and all over, are you giving to international missions? How about the Las Vegas Rescue Mission? As you give to the church, you know, our support of the Las Vegas Rescue Mission. What about places like Hope for Prisoners, which is a mission we'll be taking on next year? Those who are just coming out of prison who really don't have a lot right now, are we taking care of them? Are we giving to them? Also, look around you. There are those that are less fortunate in this community, in your church. What I'm saying is, help each other. I, I'm so excited about these principles, genuinely. I, I wish I could give you the other three. I don't have time. You all will leave. But the game of life has rules. Next week, I'll give the next three. If you learn them and you follow them, you're much more likely to win. And all I want to do is help you win. There are three more, and the three I've saved for the end obviously are the best. So now you have to come back for part two of Breaking the Bank. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God. It's so practical to us today. And Lord, today we spoke so much of these practical truths from Proverbs that we didn't give much opportunity to talk about the greatest gift of all, and that is the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, for our sins. And Father, my prayer is this, that if there's anyone here who has not yet received that gift from your generosity, that today they would receive you as their Savior. In the name of Jesus, we pray with your heads bowed and eyes closed. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 